A very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us from so many different parts of the world. Um, I'm Rajni Naidu, Professor and Director of ICHEM, which is the International Centre for Higher Education Management in the School of Management at the University of Bath. It is a very great privilege to be co-hosting um, this seminar with the Gordon Institute for Business Science at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And it is an absolute pleasure to be working with Dr. Morrison Jambeni, who is Dean and his amazing team. I hope that this is the beginning of many, many future collaborations. I would like to start by welcoming our distinguished speaker, Professor Dimo Dimov. Dimo is Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the University of Bath. Before this, he was at Newcastle University in the UK, the University of Connecticut in the USA, and IE Business School in Spain. Dimo is founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Business Venturing Insights, and Dimo has been recognized as one of the top 100 professors of entre entrepreneurship worldwide. Um, most important, Dimo is a brilliant scholar, a wonderful teacher, students absolutely are inspired by him, and for us, we're very privileged because he is also a wonderful and collaborative colleague. So Dima will be speaking for around 30 minutes. We will then have a response by Dr. Mtumbeni, who will be contextualizing for us some of Dima's ideas for our various contexts. Professor Jürgen Enders, who is co-director of ICHEM, will be the discussant, and he will select questions posed by the participants for Demo to answer. We will end with a very important final response, outlining um, some of the key points and some further areas for research by Professor Howard Thomas, who is an EFMD special advisor, is part of Gibbs, and was previously Dean of Singapore Management University. So colleagues, uh, may I please remind you that the seminar is being recorded. May I ask you please to pose your questions, your comments, any resources that you would like to share um, in the chat function, and now over to Demo. Demo, a very, very warm welcome and over to you. Thank you, Rajni, for the very kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, from around the world um, and welcome. I would like to um, say thank you, first of all, to the hosts and organizers for making this event possible, for bringing us together from around the world. Uh, for what would hopefully be uh, an interesting and um, productive dialogue and conversation. I'm very pleased to be here and, and share with you some, some thoughts about entrepreneurship, and, and particularly with the view of understanding how entrepreneurship and universities uh, can interplay. Entrepreneurship is something that we can uh, research and generate knowledge about in universities, something that we can teach to develop and inspire students to venture forward. Uh, and of course, entrepreneurship is something that universities can also do by way of evolving uh, with, with our changing times. I will um, share my screen now. And so in sharing my thoughts and laying things out, I'm going to do this in, in three stages. Uh, first, uh, I would like to start by setting some context. So think of it as a, as a provocation to put us in the mood um, for thinking about entrepreneurship in a particular way. Uh, then I will use that as a, as, a, as a starting point to try and, and define the task of, of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial thinking. So try to put some, some language around that so we can begin to, to talk about it and understand it in a particular way. And I will end with the specific ways in which we can think about developing entrepreneurial thinking. And I will showcase uh, some of my uh, most uh, recent uh, work in this uh, area. So let me start uh, by setting the stage. And this will be 
uh, with a simple story. I'd like to introduce to you uh, Ron Wayne, perhaps some of many of you may, may know him. He's a, he was a co-founder at Apple Computer back in uh, 1975. Uh, and as a co-founder of Apple Computer together with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, um, he had 10% of the business. The split was 45, 45, 10. He was the adult on the team, so to speak. He helped set it up as a business, uh, wrote the Articles of Association, designed the first logo and started putting together processes in place. And what is also very interesting about Ron Wayne is that um, soon after he, he joined and started uh, working on Apple computer, he decided that he wanted out. Uh, he wanted out and he stepped out. And in fact, he sold his stake, his 10% stake back to Steve Jobs and Wozniak. Some accounts were saved for $800, other accounts were saved for $1,500. The point is that it was nowhere near uh, where that um, stake in, in Apple, one of the companies that has surpassed $2 trillion in, in value would be, would be today. The interesting thing about this is that uh, Ron Wayne made a very, very exercise sound judgment, made a good, reasonable decision. And the reason was, was very simple. Uh, as part of a, a breakthrough for this startup, a young fledgling company, uh, they were asked to assemble 100 computers by a local computer shop. And to get things going, they needed working capital and took a bank loan. Uh, and the operation was run, as we know the story, out of, uh, out of a garage. Um, but because a company with no assets uh, to its name, the three co-founders had to sign up as, as um, guarantors with a loan, individually, separately liable. Uh, and this was a point at which Ron Way decided that this was perhaps the risk he was not ready to take. Uh, he was older than the other co-founders. He was someone who had assets, a car and a house and other things to his name. Uh, and he felt that he was more exposed in that sense to the other co-founders who were uh, barely 20 years old at that point and uh, with, with no assets to their name. So he stepped out. And it's very easy for us to look back and, and say, you know, what a, what, what, a, what a crazy decision in a way that was with, a, with a hindsight or the benefit of hindsight. But Ron Wayne was not alone. So to, to reiterate the point that he made a good exercise sound judgment, uh, Hewlett Packard at one occasion decided to decline to fund the new company. Uh, Commodore was offered to buy the entire company for a, a small amount of money and um, declined. They preferred to build their own computers. Uh, and also Atari, who at the time were making video games, also declined to, to fund. Uh, and most interestingly, perhaps, Hewlett Packard, uh, when asked on another occasion, whether they wanted to claim intellectual property rights on what was essentially created on their facilities. Steve Wozniak was working at Hewlett Packard at the time. Um, they, they considered that and, and declined. So they issued a document uh, releasing Apple to, to, to venture uh, as, as they wish. So the point here is that a large group of, of really, really smart people made this, made this decision. And of course, they don't have the benefit of hindsight to look to look from from where we stand 40 years later and and understand how things have happened so this raises a very interesting question about what good judgment is and what reason is when we when we exercise and of course universities is, is a place where we seek to exercise uh, reason of course this reminds me of, of mark twain's interesting uh, famous saying that uh, good judgment good judgment comes from experience and ex experience comes from bad judgment but it sets up a little bit of interplay but let me linger on the topic of reason and uh, it it uh, it brings this this very um, interesting quote from George Bernard Shaw uh, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world the unreasonable man assists persists in trying to adapt the world to himself therefore all progress depends on the unreasonable man and if we take this from someone who uh, understands deeply uh, you know, the human condition and its, and its history to, uh, to the business world, and this is Mark Andresen, uh, who was a uh, founder of Netscape, the first uh, browser and, and now a prominent venture capitalist uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, reflects on the investments that they have made uh, as, as venture capitalists and basically says, it seems like we've made all our money on successful and non-consensus uh, investments. And he translates non-consensus effectively as, as crazy things, and investing in things that look like they're just nuts. So if I linger in this uh, in this a little bit more, and I take the, um, the sense-making tool that Mark Anderson introduced, 
which was this simple division uh, of all the investments that they've made. He divided them into, have they been successful or, or, or failed? So that's a, it's a simple one. And on the horizontal dimension, whether they've been consensus or non-consensus. So if we think about the interplay of these two uh, dimensions, we can of course define the combination of consensus and success as what we might call normal returns. So when we do things that everybody agrees are good and reasonable and, and sound investments to do or projects, uh, we get normal returns. Uh, we get surprised when, when consensus uh, projects or ideas fail, so we could call this uh, abnormal failure. Uh, by the insights uh, of Mark Anderson, uh, of course, non-consensus, the combination of non-consensus and, and success uh, is uh, what, what he der uh, terms abnormal returns. Uh, so this is where, where we, we, we change frames, meaning changes, and all of a sudden, this is what disruption um, brings in, leads to abnormal returns. And for the sake of symmetry, it is clear that uh, we might call the last quadrant normal failure. So this gives us uh, an interesting combination of this space uh, and the interplay between success failure on one sense, uh, on one side and, and consensus, non-consensus on the other. And if we reflect on these uh, a little bit more, we would see that the question of consensus or non-consensus, it effectively, it's a question about the knowledge that we currently have and the way we look and, and interpret facts. And so this would mark a continuum uh, from whether something looks like a good idea at one end to whether something looks like a bad idea at the other end. The judgment that we exercise uh, here in, in, uh, in making that inference is precisely on the basis of the knowledge that we have and the facts that we can offer in support of something. So obviously non-consensus stretches us out into areas where we could be looking at things for which we can find no factual support, uh, so to speak. The question of success and failure, if I switch to the other uh, dimension, is really a question of time. And uh, it ultimately shows whether something is a good idea or a bad idea. And that is a question of time because only time would show uh, when, when we take the ideas forward, whether and how they work out. And time, the question of time is a question of possibilities. So we have a, a, an interesting interplay here between knowledge and, and time. Uh, and as well as facts and, and possibilities. We look back, it's all facts. Uh, there's no possibilities in the fact in the, in the past. We look ahead to the future and there are no facts. It's only possibilities. So you get a sense of that interplay. And, and of course, to, to bring it all back to our topic for the day, uh, the university is a space in which we uh, create knowledge, uh, define and exercise uh, reason. And we can think of the university as the place where we seek to understand the world uh, as it is. And it's also interesting that um, entrepreneurship in that sense um, represents the force that pushes forward, the, the, the force that tries us to, to take us a step ahead towards the world as it could be. And this sets up this, this interplay between entrepreneurship and, in, and, and universities in a way as an interplay between knowledge and, and time. And that interplay is best expressed in, in what we feel sometimes, that in order to do something, we feel that we need to know. Uh, but of course, very often, in order, in order to know, we need to do something. And, and you, can, you can get a sense of that tension in interplay. So hopefully, this, this uh, opens up questions in your mind and, and, and start thinking, OK, let's, let's now consider how we can uh, understand that relationship between um, entrepreneurship and universities. And you can see immediately, if, if entrepreneurship is the force that tries to take us forward, that, that tries to, step, to stay always a step ahead, no matter where we are, there's always a step, there is always a next. Uh, in this case, this becomes very difficult, something that's very difficult to research because we cannot, we can never grasp it, we can understand it, but it always pushes us, always stays ahead. Uh, how it is something that we can teach uh, in a way that the demonstration of the skills of entrepreneurship are always outside of the classroom. It's not what we demonstrate on an exam or a test or a degree that we get. It's always what we do next. And by the same token, uh, as, as something that we do as universities, it's always that next thing. So this brings us to uh, trying to have a way of, of defining this um, entrepreneurial task. And I'd like to see this uh, in very simple terms as an interplay, as an encounter between mind and world. So there's two things uh, that, that, that stand out uh, here. 
On the one hand, we understand the power of human imagination to imagine different worlds and to aspire and to try to change the world in, in, those, in those desired directions. So for me, uh, Lewis Carroll's quote, uh, Carroll st uh, stands out here, imagination is the only weapon in the war against reality. And on the other hand, um, I, what has stuck with me is this very, very vivid metaphor by Mike Tyson. Uh, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And that simply demonstrates to us that no matter what we do and how we aim to act upon the world, the world responds and often responds in ways that we cannot anticipate. And, and this is where, um, of course, this is where a lot of possibilities and opportunities arise simply because some of these responses are, are surprising in, in good ways. And of course, they can be surprising also in unexpected and, uh, and perhaps bad ways. Uh, so here is uh, to try to understand that interplay between mind and world. I'd like to switch to another story. Again, this is another one of my uh, favorite stories I, I um, read in a book called The Success Equation by Michael Mobusin. And this is a story of a man uh, in, the, in the 1970s who, was re who spent a long time looking for a ticket for the Spanish um, Christmas lottery, the El Gordo. And he was looking for a ticket ending in the numbers 48. He found a ticket, he bought the ticket, and won the lottery afterwards. And um, when he was asked by journalists why he was so intent on finding the ticket, he replied, I dreamt of the number seven for seven straight nights and seven times seven is 48. Um, hence, this is what he was looking uh, for. Now, the story, uh, the way Michael uh, Mobusin tells it in the book, he uses it to illustrate the tension between skill and luck. Um, and I think this is a very, very powerful story to understand the difference between understanding what people do, why they do the things that they do, and explaining the impact of their outcomes and activities. So this is, this is where it opens up a little gulf uh, between what we do and, and the consequences of what we do. So there are two uh, implications that I like to draw from this. Um, in this simple story, the intention has a causal effect on actions. So we can understand what the person does uh, simply by having the premise that seven times seven is 48. You don't think about it twice. He was looking for a ticket in 48. So that explains why he bought the particular ticket. And that has a trivial role in explaining, obviously, the outcome. I say trivial because it is clear that without purchasing a ticket, you cannot win a lottery. So this is what we sometimes hear that you know 50 percent of success is just showing up so in the ways we have to show up but uh, but beyond that uh this 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 has no explanatory power uh, in this case looking for the ticket with 48. and another powerful uh powerful um thought that i gather is this is this simple idea that the entrepreneur proposes mind seeks to act upon the world but ultimately the world disposes uh, in in sorting out the way things work out and what the outcomes are and again, this is another way of expressing that interplay between mind and world. So let's now take this and, and try to introduce a little bit more formal language in how we might be thinking about entrepreneurship. And I'd like to, to, to say this, these are, these are four premises that we can, uh, that we can use. And they're intuitive uh, to the point where uh, perhaps they don't need to be um, explained or defended. The first one is that entrepreneurship involves a person. And I use the, the term person here in a generic sense. It could be an uh, individual person, it could be a team, uh, but this is effectively the power of human enterprise. And what we can also say is that that person is an entrepreneur, is not an entrepreneur all the time, not everyone is an entrepreneur all the time, and not everyone is. So it's, it's, it's aspect of a, of, a, of a person, what they do. Uh, a person is deemed an entrepreneur, not by virtue of, of who he or she is, but by virtue of what they do. So it has to do with action or activity. Uh, and when we think about what people do, what would enable us to call an activity entrepreneurial is not by virtue of what people actually do in an embodied sense. You know, they could be planning and talking to people and this is what other business uh, people or other actors could be doing um, in, in exactly the same form, but it's by virtue of the meaning of that activity. What is, what is it? What is the meaning of it? And a meaning in turn becomes entrepreneurial when it reflects a certain intended future, something that the entrepreneur is trying to do in a forward looking sense. And in this sense, it becomes a reason or a motive for their actions. And this takes us to the idea of meaning uh, and, and intention and imagination. 
And to understand that, that this relationship between action and meaning, uh, it's interesting to think about what happens uh, with, with us as humans at about three or four years of age, when we begin to develop um, abstract thoughts and, and, and our imagination develops. Up until that point, uh, we could say that there is, a, there is a union of motives and perception. And I'm using here some of the ideas of Lev Vygotsky, a uh, Russian uh, developmental psychologist uh, who has a lot of uh, seminal uh, ideas. And uh, with that union of motive and perception, we cannot really separate meaning from the objects that we encounter, the actions of what, what we do from the, from the objects with which uh, we interact. With the development of abstract thought, we begin to separate the objects from their meaning, or we begin to separate, this, when we use words to describe objects, we have that separation between concepts and objects, if you wish. And that creates a separation uh, uh, between what Vygotsky calls the field of meaning in a field of vision. So we can look at things and we can look at them in, in, in physical or brute, um, as, as brute facts, but the meaning of those things is something that we construct uh, as humans and lay over that, over the, over the physical objects. And with that idea of a field of meaning, we can see how action can arise from ideas rather than things. So we can have a meaning that the same meaning enables us to engage with different objects and by that, uh, by, by the same token, uh, a, a motive that we have to act over the long term is something that enables us to, to connect our actions and to see them as part of a coherent whole. This is the development of, of, of a will, if you wish, or forward planning or some kind of systematic uh, activity. So this gives us a sense now that, that entrepreneurship is something that we do and it operates under this realm of a sense of opportunity that we see for the, for the kind of future we want, we would like to enact or create or bring about. So it's not about the world as it is, but it's about the world as it could be. A little bit more formality. Now this comes from um, philosophy of language and mind and the way in which we can think about intentions in, in the world that we imagine is something that we hold in our minds. So the content uh, of that, of that, of our thoughts, uh, imagination, if you wish, is what the future is imagined to be. We combine that con uh, content with a certain psychological mode that, that characterizes how we engage. And this is where we bring things such as intentions, beliefs, aspirations, hopes, and plans. And perhaps more importantly, the illocutionary force, so the way with which we would like to interact uh, is one that is described by philosopher John Searle as, as commissive which means we, we want to commit to things, we vow, we want to bring things about, we want to act upon the world. And in that sense, we can talk about a direction of fit of world to mind. We try to fit the world to what we intend to do, fit the, way, the world to the mind. And it is in this sense that our actions are fulfilled or unfulfilled, our intentions are fulfilled or unfulfilled, but we cannot really um, call them right or wrong. Uh, they're fulfilled or unfulfilled. So there's there's nothing wrong about aspiring for things to be in particular ways. So this is really uh, this is really important to emphasize. But ultimately, to come back full loop to where we started with this interplay between mind and world, um, we are free to imagine what we want. But ultimately, the conditions of, of satisfying our, our intentions and imagination is that that imagination becomes actual. This is where the world acts as a constraining force. So with this little um, abstract uh, detour, now we can think about this sense of opportunity uh, uh, of trying to act as entrepreneurs upon the world as a, as, a, as a triangle, as intentional space with three components. First, there needs to be a person there. So it's always someone's sense of opportunity and what they're trying to do. But beyond looking, you know, aspiring and believing and desiring, we need to have uh, something more concrete. We need to be able to articulate what is it we're trying to do. And this is where I talk about this, this uh, sense of a venture concept. We need to conceptualize what is the kind of world that we'd like to bring about. But equally, uh, whatever that world is, we also need to have a sense of how we might get there. So this is the, the idea of theory of change. So, so very briefly, uh, the, these two connecting concepts here. Uh, venture concept is simply giving form, shape, substance to, to imaginary future. 
being able to look at the world as it is and see what's not there, imagine what's not there and, and begin to aspire to bring it about. So unless we're able to articulate this, uh, we cannot really bring people on board. So one essential uh, role for entrepreneurs is to frame the kind of future they want to aspire to. And, and framing always creates a tension between the world as it is and the world, the world as it could be. Uh, and it is in that tension that many people can find aspiring. Uh, and and uh, look to support and join in these efforts. But as we uh, as we imagine as we imagine these ends, we articulate these as, as venture concepts. We need to be um, conscious that what we're engaging in is effectively a complex task. And as a complex task, we need to have a sense of how we might get there. And we need to have the ability to break that overall purpose, so to speak, this overall sense of venture into particular milestones to have an understanding of, of what the process uh, might consist of and what the process that we might aspire for. And then for each milestone, we, we need to begin to think in terms of concrete actions. So this is a, a, an interesting, again, we keep talking about interplays here. It's an interplay between eyes on the horizon as, in, as in what we envisage, but also having feet on the ground, is it being able to formulate what is the next thing that we're going to do always trying, being able to do something concrete. And, and it is that theory of change that allows us to, to keep all of these things together. So this now brings us into this sense of seeing entrepreneurship as an exercise of art and skill. And uh, we can see again, this idea of the triangle earlier as, as entrepreneurial activities being uh, fundamentally a combination of three things. Uh, we need to frame things, we need the ability to frame, and this is the idea of articulating what the future might look like, the skills associated with communication, imagination, um, aspiration, creativity. Uh, at the same time, we need we need engage in modeling, which, which means we need to uh, make that venture concept tangible and try to model it into something. Ultimately, it becomes something that we can execute. So that's what I call about uh, business model design as a, as a, as a one of the one of the edges there. And between the framing and the model and the sense of the blueprint we'd like to execute, we actually have to have the ability to perform and execute the tasks. Now, these are, these are three activities. They're, they're interlinked and they're iterative in the sense that if things are not going well, we can remodel, we can reframe, and we can continuously go around this triangle in trying to make things work. And because of this iterative process can be one that is, is quite uh, long, we need to have this sense of, of inner motivation, this is sense of fire, harmony, and energy to, to be able to keep the process going forward. Now, this triangle, I'd like to, uh, to get a sense here that it also marks three different um, aspects of our activities as entrepreneurs with which we, um, which we represent. The first one is the individual, as a, and I will, I will talk about individual as a system, a system in a second. But to, to create that future, to bring that value, we need to bring an organization, uh, build an organization around. So there's an organizational as organizing aspect of this. And finally, that organization, for something to be the venture, to be viable, it needs to fit in the market. So there, there's, the, there's the marketplace for society uh, as, a, as a space within which we have to um, connect our venture. So for it to be, to be operating on a sustainable basis. So this is a sense of entrepreneurship as this interplay of this, this three activities. And now this brings us uh, to the idea of developing entrepreneurial thinking. And the first thing in my mind uh, in, in taking the step towards thinking about thinking, so to speak, is that uh, there needs to be a shift in stance. And that shift in stance is uh, what I call, although it's, it's not uh, my idea, it comes, comes from the, the work of, uh, Jer of uh, Gregory Bateson on the, in, in the ecology of mind, is this idea of going from lineal to recursive. And lineal simply means that we, we, we seek to act upon the world in this linear sense. If, if things are not working out, we just change what we do. And shifting from that to recursive means that as the world responds, we have the opportunity to reflect on who we are, how we think, where we are, the context in which we are. And we try to re-enable, re-imagine, redefine, remodel as a, as a, as a way of, of moving forward in interactive. So we, this is the space in which we exercise reflection and, and metacognitions. That's what recursive means. We have a chance at each step of the way 
to to reflect uh, and and reformulate how we how we move ahead. And I would like to, here now to highlight uh, this. Uh, this brings us to um, what uh, I might call the realm of thinking. In this recursive sense in which we interact with the world, this realm of thinking implies a simple process uh, through which we go in, in engaging with the world. We take things as true. So there's a, there's a certain premises that we use to formulate what we do. And doing and making these commitments of doing is simply the things that we'd like to make true. So we take things as true, seek to make things true, and there are consequences to which the, the world responds. Just like in a tennis match, we always get the ball back when we try to react to it. And uh, so this thinking is really about the premises and the commitments that we make. These are, these are two different ways in which we exercise our thinking. What we take as premises for what we do and what we actually seek to do in terms of the commitments we would like to execute. Now, this area, the first area around this interplay between this thinking through and, and, and making through is the area of meaning. And this is, again, the context, the discourse with which we engage, the meaning with which we operate to a large thing defines and influences what we take as true and what we seek to make through. So it gives us a sense of what we aim to do. On the consequences side, if we start thinking about the world as, as a system of, of interconnected parts, uh, we can begin to understand um, the fact that some of these consequences cannot really be predicted, and we just need to take them as they, as they come. And this feedback loop that we have in the middle is this idea of recursivity as, as again, the ability to react to feedback all the time and be reflective and reevaluate the premises and perhaps reevaluate and change our commitments. Um, and uh, with this, uh, with all this in the background, I'd like to, to, to highlight here the, the recent work um, that I've been doing with a, with a um, great friend and colleague, Professor Joseph Pistrui uh, from the IE um, Business School in Madrid. And we've been uh, co-founders of this uh, kinetic thinking as a, as a framework for developing uh, new ways of thinking. The central premise of, 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 of kinetic thinking is that we each have um, perhaps default or habitual ways of thinking that reflects our socialization, our working life experience. And when we, when we don't think about how we think, we tend to respond in these habitual ways. So kinetic thinking is the simple idea There's that by, by being reflective and, and more metacognitive about how we think, we can enable new ways, new styles of thinking, which enables us to respond to the situations in, in, in an expanded way, interact with these situations, engage with those situations in an expanded manner. So to come back to the earlier idea of entrepreneurship as framing, modeling, and performing, uh, the simple ideas of systems, meaning, and recursivity lie at the basis of, of kinetic thinking as a way of enabling new styles of thinking, managing, and leading. And what these represents in each case whether we manage ourselves as individual thinkers, whether we manage an organization uh, where we, we seek to work and enable others, or whether we lead an organization in terms of where it fits in the marketplace. In each of these cases, we have this simple interplay of the levers of premises and commitments. They just look different depending on whether we're just working with ourselves, uh, working with others, or working with entire organizations. So at the, at the, if you think about individuals as a, as a thinking system is a system of habits and beliefs. For individuals, this recursive sense of engaging in the world comes down to two things, what we see and what we do. Uh, this is the way we operate our thinking. And the way these, we operate these two levels define distinct styles that reflect our habits. And we've developed tools where we enable people to uh, get a sense of what their habitual style or default style is and, and give them a map for how this could be expanded in a wider range. Within organizations, when we work with others, these two levers uh, of premises and commitments uh, relate to processes and priorities. How do we set priorities and how do we oversee processes? And again, that defines uh, how these are operated, defines a set of, of managing styles in a similar, we get a sense of what our default style is, but also how we can develop as, as managers of others. And finally, in, a, in, a, in an organizational, in a, in a sense in which the organization interfaces with the market and we look at ahead, trying to define our space in the marketplace, a leader, these two, these two levers for a leader work uh, in the sense of the horizons they set for the organizations and the boundaries 
within which they would like the organization to operate. And again, that defines a set of styles. Uh, we get a sense of what habitual style might be and how these styles might be developed uh, in, a, in a broader sense. I would like to end now on this uh, reflective note that uh, this idea of interplay, of interacting with the world in this back and forth manner, ultimately raises the question of how we can leverage uh, what life does very well. Life is a complex form, is, is, is evolving and learning and co-evolving in this interesting space between order and chaos or order and disorder. And this is about steering the journey. Ultimately, thing is about steering that journey to, to be able to, to navigate and harness the path of complexity, which is, which is what brings learning and co-evolution. And as part of that steering, to use the, the, the metaphor, the metaphorical language of this, this little rowing boat or, or canoe, we, we have these two levers at our, at our disposal, really. We can regulate things, which we're trying to make things orderly, but at the same time, if not to, not to let things become too orderly and rigid, we have this other lever of novelty, which, which enables us to, to go back and steer towards the middle. And it works exactly like this in the other direction. If we have too much novelty, it comes a point where we'd like to bring some order and, uh, and, and structure to things as, as a way of finding that middle path. Um, so on that note, um, this is my reflective end. I'd like to thank you for your, your attention and patience and uh, let the conversation begin. Thank you very, very much, uh, Jimo. Um, that was an amazing uh, discussion because you you took something that was um, that is so so complex. Um, there are so many different levels. Uh, there there's so many overlaps. There there's so many kind of um, contrasts. For example, between order and chaos, um, the interplay between imagination and time and opportunity and and reality. And and what you did is by by really. Uh, using stories and, and using metaphor, you really uh, brought that alive for us. And I'd like to thank you very, very much. Um, that was just really incredible. And um, kinetic thinking, something I would like to think a lot more about, and I'm sure that may come out in, in the questions as well. So thank you for um, a, a presentation that really sparked all of our um, inner fires. And I'd like to now turn to, to Dr. Morris uh, for his response. Morris, over to you. Thank you, Rajani, and thank you so much for inviting us to co-host this event with Bath University. And I really want to take the opportunity to thank you, Dimo, for really a wonderful and provocative presentation. And it's always a pleasure to listen to an accomplished scholar and you certainly did not disappoint. Too often in the field of entrepreneurship, we come across a refrain that entrepreneurs do not have uh, time to engage with higher education because the view is that we are too academic and we are disconnected from the real difficulties of entrepreneurship. But more importantly, the investment required for entrepreneurs to engage with academia is not rewarded by the opportunity that they lose by not being in the market. This presentation of yours, this provocation of yours is a powerful and, and simple uh, renunciation of that argument. It presents an alternative perspective, one that I believe resonates not only with me, but with many on this webinar. And that is higher education institutions have an important role in framing, shaping, and in acting entrepreneurship. Of course, we are not suggesting that we are the only role players in this regard, but I think what you have done in terms of how you've helped to kind of in a simplified way, bring a lot of academia into this process without necessarily referring to the depth and wealth of knowledge that led you to those insights further demonstrates what role we can play in the field of, in, in the field of academia in, in acting, enabling, and facilitating 
this process of entrepreneurship. As an accomplished scholar, you both as an editor in chief of a Journal of Business Venturing and also an author in highly ranked journals, you've made a significant contribution in the field. I really appreciate how you invoke words, especially if I refer, if you don't mind, Dimo, in your 2021 article that you co authored titled One Tiny Drop Changes Everything Constructing uh, Opportunity with Words that has recently been published in Journal of Business Venturing. Here you aptly, in this presentation, linking to this, pres to this article, you aptly demonstrated this truism by linking George Bernard Shaw with Mark Andreessen and Mike Tyson. I don't think Mike Tyson is often uh, quoted um, in academic spaces, but certainly I've come across that quote and I've always found it to be enormously powerful. You've done so to illustrate this notion of entrepreneurship being that about separating the normal from the abnormal. This notion, therefore, of reframing what the late, the late uh, uh, Clayton Christensen of HBS calls disruptive innovation, being about this operating this abnormal space for the underserved. And certainly many in the world remain underserved, which then suggests there's a huge opportunity for entrepreneurial framing and entrepreneurial thinking and, and new entrepreneurial processes, particularly in a world that is now going to be refined, redefined and redrawn post COVID or in the new COVID era, the world of pandemics as we are now getting to become accustomed to. And maybe if you don't mind, I will also um, refer some of the listeners to another article which you um, published in the Academy of Management Perspectives um, uh, titled Opportunities, Language and Time. And here, once again, you really invoke this notion of fact and knowledge um, being separated um, by time, where success and failure is separated by time. And once again, demonstrating how uh, higher education players can really play an important role in this process and this journey of entrepreneurship. Finally, the idea that entrepreneurship is about people, i.e. who does what and for whom, this notion of a venture concept being about the purpose, this meaning making, um, this bringing life to ideas and concepts, but not only being about purpose, but also being about uh, the steps that you have to think about, as well as the milestones to ensure that we are practical in the ideas that we imagine. Now, ultimately, closing the loop again, back to the world of academia is this notion that the tools that we bring to this entrepreneurial conundrum is this notion of theories of change. And to that extent, I want to thank you for really taking us through this recursive journey, if I may, because I am that way inclined, felt more like a discursive journey um, than a recursive one, but we can agree to disagree in due course. And I want to thank you, Rajani and Dimo, and hand over back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Morris. Um, you've really extended and contextualized and, and thrown more insight, especially for very many different types of contexts and the university. Um, and that has also given rise now to us thinking uh, in different sorts of ways and, and to also engaging with some of the questions that have already come out in, in the chat about the role of the entrepreneurial university. And I liked your uh, discursive and recursive analogy as well. So very many thanks. And I now turn to uh, Jürgen Enders, who is the uh, discussant, who will uh, look at the questions and pose them to Demo. Um, colleagues, if you could please pose your questions in the chat function. Um, for those who have already posed questions in the Q&A, I will um, transfer that to the chat function. Jürgen, over to you. Thank you very much, Rajni, and very many thanks um, to Demo. Um, very inspiring, very insightful. Um, 
I think I will not take now questions in kind of the sequence as they appear, but rather try to make that into, if you like, semantic blocks. Um, there was there was something that also came to my mind, uh, where somebody wrote to be creative means to be happy. Um, and I let me put it as a question to you, Demo, in the way of what do you think might be the role of emotions in all of this? Thank you, Jürgen. Um, just, to, just to clarify, emotions as in this link between creativity and, and happiness. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, how can I say, we, we I, I mean, I put it into my words now, right? You know, you could say you, you introduced us to, to something that was very much inspired by cognitive perspectives, including psychological cognitive perspectives. And I think in that comment that I read, there was kind of something about, well, and how about feelings? Hmm. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer this in a, in a perhaps slightly roundabout way. Um, hmm. let, me, let, me just, uh, let me just say that I, I've been, uh, one, of the, one of the writers and scholars that I've been very inspired by was a physicist, uh, David Bohm. Mm -hmm. David Bohm uh, sees reality in, in our world when it is something that's interconnected. So in this case, you can you can you can think that emotions and thinking are ultimately interconnected, mm -hmm. and they they operate under under spaces of meaning, and which which ultimately brings us back to this idea of consensus and non-consensus that we, we spoke earlier. So it's all about feeling and emotions, and and the emotions is is very often the, the words we use to describe you know states or physiological states and they they come from the meaning that we ascribe to to things so it has to do with the fact and and how we describe certain certain actions uh, so uh, again i'm being roundabout here but I, it takes me to think about classroom say i, I want to bring this to education uh, and so I think about a, a child who in in many ways is very creative and likes to explore but in an educational setting, a child could be labeled as disruptive and disruptive, not another learner. So we, we, we use labels. Uh, and if, you, if a label disruptive is used, you can imagine how that triggers an emotion which is related to happiness because it, the, the, the mere word disruptive uh, implies something negative and that can, that can trigger emotions as well. So whether we see a behavior as, as creative or disruptive, whether in an organization we see someone who walks around and thinks, we can think about, oh, they're thinking about the future. We can also say, oh, they're wasting their time and they're wasting their institution's resources. You can, you can, we can see that they're really, really interesting boundaries. And they're not really boundaries. The boundaries that we impose uh, through the language that we use and through how we, how we see things. And so this, this idea of, of creativity and happiness is ultimately a question of whether we're in a context whether where these uh, where such creativity that comes very uh, inherently to us, you know, with children they they're, they're curious and they have imagination. These are these are things that they do. They they excel at, uh, and then somehow often that that gets extinguished as we go through socialization, education, and experiences. And then the irony of this is often in executive education we seek to become children again, rekindle that that sense of imagination and, and curiosity. So um, if we if we create the right context, then yes, creativity and happiness can go really well together. Uh, but but think about the context where I would like to be creative and express that. Uh, but the context would would treat what I do uh, with, with a label that would, would that may necessarily be negative, uh, and that, that would give rise to challenges. So perhaps not a direct answer to your question, but. But, no, but an answer, no. an answer that invites further reflections. Yeah, yeah, further. right, right, right. And it would immediately want me to, but my role is a bit diff different now, as you know. Um, so there has been a number of comments and questions, um, kind of unsurprisingly, about, around the issues of entrepreneurship training. Um, skill formation, you might say. Um, can we actually do that? How can we do that? Um, 
what could be um, maybe the best way to put it, what is our knowledge, what are our experiences with that, also within the university context, because we know that more and more universities um, provide something in that area. Could you say something about that, Dimo? So, uh, thank you again. This is a, it's a great question. And uh, uh, in a way, my, my, my thinking has been in this area precisely along the lines of which the question is posed. And the idea of introducing the triangle of, of framing, modeling, and performing uh, was in a way to create a space in which universities can actually play a very, very important role. Uh, the sense of performing, the sense of the actual execution and, and development of, of skills, that comes from experience and practice, right? Universities uh, can, can get the process going, but it's not a place where we, we, we do that experience and with that experiential learning, uh, so to speak, in, in exercising and developing our skills further. However, on the questions of framing and modeling, uh, you know, universities can become a place where we can uh, a place where we can exercise our imagination and, and have and have conversations and dialogue about what futures we might want, what the, what the world uh, could look like. And, and certainly, certainly, that's a space where you have that through the through the sheer number of, of people with different backgrounds and, and different disciplines that the university brings together. This can become a basis for mm -hmm. very very uh, productive exploration that framing angle. Framing goes hand in hand with communication and that ability to communicate and exercise ideas um, more, um, express ideas more clearly. And again, university is a space for that dialogue where I can say things and you can ask, you can ask questions. And I try to clarify what I say as a way of, of, of taking it towards more clear expression. So if, it, if you think about the classroom as a space where we give and ask for reasons, uh, and the classroom can become a really, really productive space in that case. So that, that's the framing, which is really about opening up what the future might look like. And, and then the university can play a, a certain role in how we model this. Uh, so so I, I've used the analogy of modeling. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to see entrepreneurs and architects is very similar in what they, in what they do. Uh, an architect builds a system, which is a building, and an architect can look at a space and imagine a building, and their role is then to, tr to translate that idea into, into a model uh, with which we, we obviously interact. And once this is decide what the model is, we build a blueprint, pass it on to a construction company, and they build the building. An entrepreneur, in what they envisage and what they would do, they also build a structure, but that structure is made not of, of bricks and glass the way a building would be. It's a structure made of relationships and people and interactions mm -hmm. And so production in exchange and the way you, you put this in, in an organizing framework. So it's also a structure. And it's a similar process. We start with envisaging, then we try to model and to see what is what is feasible and how we engage with it. And then once we have a sense that this is feasible, we can talk about uh, how do we build this and perhaps building it on a larger scale. So in the same way, framing and modeling the way they work for, for architects and architects are obviously educated at, or at universities, we can do the same with entrepreneurs. And if we treat them as architects, um, it's it, interesting parallels can come with, with architectural education. They, they, have a, you know, they have studios where architects go in and discuss ideas and present their ideas and, and, and try to converse around them as a way of exploring possibilities. Uh, so this is, a, you know, for the sake of, of laying out possibilities, the question here is, why not? It's something that we can certainly try. Thank you, Timo. Um, makes me think about social engineering in some ways. You know, this parallel to architecture. Um, there, there was one tiny little simple question that I find quite intriguing in the chat. It just is, when does an entrepreneur become a successful entrepreneur? Or in other words, how do we know that an entrepreneur is successful? Well, I, I, I would distinguish that question. I suppose we could, we could answer that question internally and externally. Uh, internally is, is, is the answer. Uh, if, I, if I take pleasure in, in what I do, then, then success is, is simply by virtue of the fact that I'm I'm doing what I love doing, so it's success in that. 
uh, there's a question of what what is driving the person, and mm-hmm. and and the question of whether and so every everybody has their own definition of success in that sense. So th- this is the internal answer. Uh, the external answer is to what extent we can we can look at others and and say whether they've been successful or not without knowing what is it that they were trying to do. Um, and I, I again I'm a I give these roundabout answers, but uh, this reminds me of a scene, and I, I apologize if I take people to. There's a great scene in the film, uh, The Magnificent Seven. This is the classic version from the 60s. Mm. And the scene is uh, where Brett is one of the good guys, one of the sevens, uh, one of the bad guys, let's use that language, uh, jumps on the horse and tries to run away. And Brent, Brett gets up, pulls out a gun, and tries to, looks at the, you know, uh, aims, uh, and he shoots it very far into the distance and, and shoots, and the other, the bad guy, falls off the horse. And this person sitting next to Brett says, great shot. And Brett said, I was aiming for the horse. <laughs> and so here, here is an example where we look from the outside and see this was successful. And, and in my mind, you know, I was, I was going for something different. Um, right. And so this is, again, a great question. And, uh, and, and perhaps we should, we should not try and define things too much from the outside, but, but, but try and give that uh, inner voice a stronger expression. Um. More and more questions are coming in now. I try to create something a little bit like a red thread. Um, Another question now addresses this, generically speaking, the role of environmental conditions, constraints, enablers, opportunities, resources. You know what, what in your feedback loop kind of thinking, you know, that, um, or the tennis match metaphor, you know, the world kicks back um, and we have to be prepared for that in some ways and to respond to that. Um, And I think the question is, um, what, how can I say, to what extent is that actually really framing, conditioning entrepreneurial activities? Or to what extent can it kind of break out of the of this cage um, we all live in? Just trying to mute myself again, a, a great question. Um, th- there, there is all these conditions and all these forces, um, and, and I like to think of these forces as messages that the world sends to us. And when I say that, it's not that we're outside of the world. But in, a, in this interplay between mind and world, we, we take that information. We have the power of, of interpreting and, and giving that information meaning. Often that meaning is shared and we take things for granted when we look at something and say, well, this is a bad thing or this is a good thing. But uh, if you take the simple question, the simple example of, of, of COVID, for instance, in, in the way, I mean, it's been obviously been uh, uh, it's a disastrous in event in many ways. But if you ask the question, is COVID an enabler or a disabler, different people will give you different answers. Mm. If you're, you know, if you're in the UK and if you're running, if you're running a, a wedding a business and with wedding venues, you say this has been a complete disabler. You know, the business is coming to a stop. But if you're uh, if you're a Zoom and you know behind that technology, it's, it's been a tremendous enabler. So whether something is an enabler or a disabler is ultimately related to the questions that we ask. And uh, and if we pose a question, you know, here is what we're getting back: the, the ball gets to get sent back our way. And uh, what can we do with this? What what positive or productive next step can we can we take? This is a this is a simple question. That could actually take us away from established uh, ways ways of thinking. So this is a, this is a ultimately whether something is a disabler or enabler is a, is a, is a function of the questions that we like to ask when we when we face it. And if we call it a disabler, then uh, then that, that ultimately constrains it because that 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 is preframed the way the way we look at something. Um, there is a how can I say a related but different set of questions. I would like to move on to in a moment, but I allow myself now to ask something myself because it kind of bridges and hopefully. Um, 
the way you think about entrepreneurship seems to me a way of thinking that would not only be applicable to market activities, but also to forms of entrepreneurship, I don't know if we then may use this word, that are actually not operating on the marketplace, that are not necessarily an issue of production and consumption, of profit making, of you know all these things that kind of define the modern meanings of market. How do you think about that, Dimo? Well, in uh, again, a great, great question. Uh, thank you, Jürgen. And in one of the labels I was trying to use in the presentation is I use under the person I use the term change agent. Mm. So when I look at the entrepreneur as a change agent, that mm. immediately gives you a much wider range of the, the context in which we can we can talk about change. I'm just mindful that um, I don't want to be in a situation where where I would say, well, entrepreneurship needs to take over the world. Everything is entrepreneurship every time we talk about change. But I see I see that there's a huge overlap between a change agent and entrepreneur. And, and sometimes entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship has historically this connotation of being related to business. Um, but of course, I, I have recently, and that's it's something I'd love to investigate, but something that I came upon about the origin of the word entrepreneur, and we associated with the French uh, to undertake entrepreneur. But uh, I found an origin in Sanskrit, uh, which, which means antaprana, meaning uh, inner motivation, inner breath of life. Uh, and if that's something internal, if that is really, that is really true, uh, then you can see a much wider range in which you can see yourself in, 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 in academia when we try to present new ideas. There, there's an entrepreneurial angle mm -hmm. to that. In science, the advance of science is, is often, uh, often this, this crazy idea that, that once it gets true, it changes the way we look at the world. It creates that, that, that same kind of disruption that we see in the entrepreneurial space. So I think that the process is probably very similar. Uh, it's just the language and the specifics around what, what, what things are done, they, they, they vary. Hmm. Thank you, Dimo. Um, another set of questions, comments, <clears throat> is about something that you <clears throat> did not directly approach in your presentation, and that is what we frame as the entrepreneurial university. So now not the university as a place that has a role to play in understanding entrepreneurship, in teaching, entrepreneurship, but the university itself as an organization being entrepreneurial. And, um, and basically, you know, the, all these comments and questions are around, um, can universities as deeply conservative organizations actually be entrepreneurial? You know, I always remember the, the, the former president of the University of California, he said, or oh, wrote, universities and graveyards have one thing in common. They are hard to move. You know, that kind of notion, framing of the university. How do you think about that? I think this takes us back to the um, original uh, framing around consensus and non-consensus. So th this the sense that mm. uh, you know is it realistic to, to think of universities as entrepreneurial? That's a, you know this seems to be what the consensus is. But but the real question is why not? Uh, we we can indulge in and explore. You know what what it, so the question becomes it's not whether universities can or cannot be entrepreneurs, but what are the ways in which we can make. Uh, universities entrepreneurial. We take that as a premise. Let's think of uh, universities as, 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 as entrepreneurial. And we can answer the question, in what case, in, in what way can, can our university be, be entrepreneurial? What are, the, what are the simple things that we can put in motion? And it's, it's not about envisaging exactly what, the, what, what an entrepreneurial university is going to look like, but it allowing, allowing it to take a first step in that entrepreneurial direction and, and let that recursive process take its shape. You know, do a thing and see, you know, see what happens and build, build, build upon it. 
But to go back to the the the, the image with which I close, which was with the two rows, the, the regulation and the novelty. Uh, you know, what happens if you only roll with the side of regulation? What happens is the board is just turning around, right? And so in a way, a university that's not entrepreneurial is just using one paddle and it just circles around in place and the rest of the world can be moving on. And so think about the magic of just grabbing that other paddle and just, you know, doing a few moves with it, letting, letting novelty come, come, come in. And, uh, and this can take you, certainly will take you outside of the spinning path. Uh, and it, it will take you in a, in a new direction. But it's that idea, that this sense of, of letting go, which I imagine is, is not, not that it's scary to individual people, but obviously collectively it, it, it kind of freezes things and, and it keeps an institution in, in place. Uh, but we can think about, you know, what are the simple things that we can do to enable some of that spirit uh, of the entrepreneurial to, to come in, in what an, what an university does. You know, we can re-examine what does education mean, we can what does teaching mean, uh, and, and various other things. Thank you, Dimo. This is the, the image of rowing with that one pedal is very, <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> and it actually links up very nicely to the other keyword that popped up in this stream of little conversations around the entrepreneurial university. And the other key word is risk. Um, so there are people saying to what extent would society allow universities to be risk taking? To what extent would universities themselves allow themselves to be risk taking? And I would personally add to this, we have lived now, at least in our country, in, in a regulatory world where we have to manage risk. And we have just published something based on a whole series of leadership interviews in British universities. You can see how that makes leaders risk averse. They roll with the one pedal, um, be, partly because they mix up. They do not understand the difference between risk and unpredictability, I think. Um, so what, what is it? Uh, what I'm trying to say is I think regulation frames the mindset, if you see what I'm trying to say. And there seems to be an interesting dilemma or precarious balance um, between these things. So um, how risk-taking can universities be? Another, um, another yeah, great sorry, question. Deepak. No, but I, 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 love, I, love the, I love the question. Um, and I have to say that risk is probably one of the most uh, one of the most misused and misunderstood words. And, and the risk, and the, the the word risk has probably been dissociated of, uh, from concrete things. It's become one of these scary things. Oh, we need to, oh, we need to just mention it and uh, taking risk. Oh no, we don't want to do that. But we don't ask the question: What does it actually mean to take risk? What are we talking about in, in very tangible uh, tangible terms? And. Um, I'd like to say that in my uh, in my own research, uh, and this was in in the context of I was doing looking at venture capitalists and their investments, uh, established early on this this very interesting uh, contrast between there is a difference between minimizing risk and maximizing success. These are just mm -hmm. two different ways in which they operate. And uh, what comes to mind was a classic study. It was it was done one of these uh, experiments. Um, and the study became became the basis of what eventually was you know was one of our uh, you know theory of effectuation which is which is quite widely used around. But uh, what what's more valuable to me is the study where that theory came from, and and the study contrasted entrepreneurs and bankers. So bankers were were uh, mm -hmm. in how they approach uh, this hypothetical situation of trying to launch um, a, a new venture. It was interesting that the bankers. Um, they set a target that they wanted to achieve, a target return, and they focused all their efforts on minimizing risk. Mm. And so when you think about minimizing risk, it's about all the things that you would like to avoid. You try to imagine all the things that you go, they can go wrong and you try to avoid this. 
But of course, thinking about the things that could go wrong that you want to avoid uh, doesn't mean that you have a, a productive way of, of. Doesn't mean that if you avoid these, you you will be you, you will be successful because success could come from yet another thing. And what entrepreneurs do in that, did in that hypothetical scenario is they set a level of risk, something that they were comfortable with. And this could be, I want to give this a two years of my time. And if it if it doesn't work out, I would move on. But I would have learned a lot two years. And I, I know exactly what, what, I, what I stand to lose. They quantify the downside, if you wish. And if you're comfortable with the downside, you don't think about it. So you set a level, a comfortable level of risk, and you just focus all your effort on maximizing success or trying to make it work within these parameters. So the question then becomes not whether universities can take risk, but they can ask the question, what is the, what is the level of risk with which they actually right. be comfortable? And, uh, you know, what does risk look like? Is it, is it giving someone, you know, that they can spend some time exploring something? Risk doesn't have to be necessarily financial. It's, it's, uh, universities have this great advantage of, of bringing together um, excellent people. And, uh, and, and perhaps it's just about enabling them to work on things and at the end of the day, you know, is it, is it, could you say that the time that they spend trying to solve big problems, is that necessarily a waste of time if it doesn't lead to a result? You know, what's the worst thing that can happen? And, and sometimes when we think about risk, it's a simple question that we don't ask. And therefore, we get carried away. Um, and I know, you know, risk registers and all these right. things that they ask me to, to list and, and anticipate. And, and that steers people to, to look in, are we avoiding these things? Are we avoiding these pitfalls? And in a way, we're not looking at the role, we're just looking at, at just making sure we, we avoid things rather than approach. And, you know, approach and avoidance, classical idea from psychology and regulatory focus theory is two different, two different ways that we can engage uh, with, with situation. Approach, we want to achieve and succeed. Avoidance is we want to avoid things and stay clear of certain areas. So again, this duality, this tension between two things, and that's a, that's a theme that seems to be uh, reverberating across. Thank you, Dimo. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, there is another <clears throat> set of questions and comments that kind of move now to the role of the people, of the individual. Um, so I just start with I can kind of understand where that comes from. There's a question about, can an introvert be an entrepreneur? Or if you want, you know, you could say, what is actually the role of personality traits? Maybe that's a way of, um, what, what do we know about that? You know, about the, um, how this may, may influence the motivation, willingness, capabilities of individuals to see themselves, imagine themselves as entrepreneurs and then really becoming an entrepreneur? Another, another great question. Um, I think I can, this question, you, you could approach it from, from several different angles. Uh, in one sense, if you think about entrepreneurship, is that entrepreneur is, is, uh, is this sense of inner motivation, of, of beginning, of starting things. This is something that comes from the inside. Uh, and you could actually say that introverts would be better placed for that because they, they, they would be in, in, in better touch with what drives them internally. If you use that distinction between introverts and extroverts, and extroverts are looking, are looking for signals from the outside looking for the outside to define what they do, whereas introverts would find that, that intrinsic, intrinsic force. So from that angle, um, you know, you could argue that they would be, they would be a better position. Um, from another angle, you would ask, well, in, in the very framing of the question, uh, it, it seems that people assume that extroverts are a better position to be entrepreneurial. Right. You know, what, what's, the, what's the evidence for that? I don't think we have evidence for that. Uh, and, and we cannot really judge by by the people we, whom we see most often on the cover of magazines and what the media is talking about, because by definition, they're the ones who relish the exposure and therefore we see them, but that doesn't mean that this, there's, there's something systematic behind, behind that. And at the third level, 
uh, you know, part of the part of the entrepreneurial endeavor is is not to work alone, but to find others to work with. And you can see whether where you can actually connect and work with others with complementary skills. And if 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 I'm an introvert and I find uncomfortable the idea of selling and engaging with other people, which which requires that that external uh, you know, to go out there and try to promote my idea, if that's uncomfortable, then, then someone else on the team could be could do that. Mm-hmm. So so in that sense, there's nothing preventing us from, from creating a balanced team. And, and so there mm-hmm. there is a you know, there is a balance between uh, introversion and extroversion. And uh, again, I love the book Quiet. Uh, mm-hmm. And the book Quiet was was uh, about the power of introverts. And you know, this is <laughs> so you know, there, there's there's this negative uh, connotation. Right. That's associated with with introversion, but um, when we think about thinking, you know, that's that's the space in which which entrepreneurs thrive, because you can actually take the time to to um, think things through, reflect. So if 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 you, if you think about to replace introversion with reflection, then you can say, well, could reflective people become entrepreneurs? Mm-hmm. I said, of course. My book uh, came out a few years ago. It was called The Reflective Entrepreneur, right. <laughs> which is all about the power of reflection in, in engaging with that recursive journey and, mm-hmm. and, and making sense you know, with, with how the world responds. So reflection mm-hmm. is a very, very powerful mm-hmm. um, mechanism. Thank you very much, Dimo. I, I personally would like to keep going with this, um, <laughs> but I'd be running out of time. Um, and uh, but very many thanks for um, all these interesting insights and ideas shared with us. Um, I hand back now to Rajni, um, who will move us forward in this uh, session. Thank you, Dima. And thank you, excellent questions, and, and you, you did a fantastic job in in in. in synthesizing them and you know keeping yeah, the conversation that, forward, that so is with with big hands to our audience you know who um, gave me all this to um, to think about and to ask about okay rajni are you there yes so many many thanks jürgen for that great job and demo mm-hmm. we couldn't talk for absolutely ages, so interesting, so important, so challenging in in so many ways. Um, It's now my very great pleasure to ask Howard Thomas to give his reflections, his insights, and also to allow us to look at areas for further research. Howard is always very provocative and very interesting. So Howard, I'm looking forward very much to what you have to say. Over to you. Uh, am I on now? I can't. I can't see myself, but uh, you are uh, on, Howard. Am I? Okay. Yes. Well, I. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say to Demo, and um, that was an excellent talk, and reflected so many di- different disciplines amongst it. That it's very hard to to summarize a talk like that. However, I'm going to try in the way that. I normally do, which is to actually try and unpick two two elements, one of which is what I, you know, you your latest book, which has a tantalizing title called What is the Entrepreneurial Scholar, which I haven't read, uh, obviously, because it's only just come out and it's not exactly my field. But on the other hand, it seems to me that from your talk, I get the influences which range from decision and risk theory, Design thinking, um, they can also come from behavioral psychology and uh, behavioral decision making. And many of the um, elements in your model um, about business modeling and so on are derivations, but creative derivations of those kinds of things. And so I, I welcome those. But the one other thing that obviously came out from people's conversations were about traits of entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, um, traits of roundedness, imagination, originality, resilience, I could go on. And there's a sort of trait theory and cognitive psychology element to what you're writing about. But actually what I'd like to focus upon is the notion of entrepreneurial universities. Um, um, I speak as a 
what, what Gibbs calls an extraordinary professor, which is a, that I'm a visiting professor at Gibbs. But Gibbs um, has a characteristic which is very, very similar to Singapore Management University, which is where I was dean uh, for six years from 2009 to 2015, which was a startup business school. Um, and it started in the year 2000, exactly the same year that Gibbs started as a startup business school. And I have just finished a book on um, SMU as an entrepreneurial university, which hasn't yet been published, but will be published before the end of the year. But I think the notion and where you started, Demo, was you started with a concept of universities as creating knowledge and entrepreneurs seeking to push universities forward. If you take the concept of an entrepreneurial university, uh, one of the things I'd like to do after I finish this SMU book is to do exactly the same study for Gibbs at 20 as I did for SMU at 20. But one of the things I would, I would uh, stress in both cases is that they had many entrepreneurial characteristics because of their founding, because of the environmental characteristics and things of that kind. And I was very engaged by the comment, I don't know, uh, Jürgen related it, the comment about his own study or study that has been done in Bath about um, the leaders of British universities and the influence of regulation upon the activities of leaders of British universities. And I think that would be a fascinating study in and of itself to look at from the point of view of entrepreneurial universities. I, have, I was dean at Warwick Business School before I became dean at uh, SMU. And, you know, th thank the Lord that I wasn't dean at Warwick Business School in the last five years when we've had not just thrust upon us the research excellence framework, but the teaching excellence framework, the knowledge excellence framework. You're almost over-regulated to the extent that the environment and the mechanisms that control the environment impede the flow of entrepreneurial activity. And I think that the study of entrepreneurial universities, which didn't start with me, but is a, a theme that started with Burton Clark from the University of California, Los Angeles, who studied six entrepreneurial universities in the late 1990s. And then there's been a stream of research that's been coming up very, very recently about the notion of entrepreneurial adaptive universities. The question I would pose is a question that was within Jürgen's questions, well, we've just had a pandemic. And in that pandemic, we have witnessed, you know, people, fortunately not like myself, because I have got gray enough hair to largely avoid this phenomenon, but that people have suddenly been thrust from teaching face to face to um, various Heath Robinson ways of teaching online courses in a manner in which many of them have not been trained but in before. I mean, there are exceptions. When I was in Singapore Management University, we were required to do emergency preparedness for teaching online learning. So even when I was there, I taught a, a course through online learning. Instituted de Impresa in Madrid as a business school has been probably at the forefront of universities that have developed entrepreneurial platforms. And, and Santiago Iniguez, who is the, now the president of IE University, wrote a book called The Learning Curve, which talked about how difficult it is to build platforms of that kind. And so what I would point you towards is, I have done a number of studies as Rajni and, and Jürgen and a number of others who are in the field of management education know about management education over uh, the last two decades in, in Africa and Latin America, more importantly, uh, with global open, open innovation jams. And everybody talked about the need for change, but nothing happened really in the uh, technology and enabled learning space until the pandemic came. There were very few, uh, if you like, of those thinkers that that uh, Demo talks about, who actually conceived of the notion of a hybrid kind of model uh, earlier than 2019-20. There had been um, 
online learning models. I have to say that when I was dean at Warwick Business School, we developed a, what I would call a second generation, early third generation online learning model, which now is number one, I'm delighted to say, uh, for the current dean in Warwick Business School in the FT rankings for online learning programs. We were an early innovator, but hardly an innovator in terms of the quality of technology, but the ability to see how to move uh, an online program onwards. What you saw in management schools worldwide is a very, very quick transition to um, online learning, some with success, some not with success, but people now talking about stackable degrees, about hybrid learning models and so on and so forth. And I think this came about, you know, there's no such thing as a good crisis. I've forgotten who said that, but, you know, I'm not as good at, as Demo at getting my phrases. But I'd like to conclude by a few other metaphors. I mean, I was, I was curious about um, uh, um, Demo's metaphor, Mike Tyson, which was essentially, if you're punched in the face, you'll know about it. And the question is, do you get up and do something about it? And I was reminded in this particular situation uh, of a friend of mine who was one of the founders of Symantec, an alumnus of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, of which I was dean before I was dean at Warwick. And he failed six times before actually his software uh, uh, exercise with Symantec became successful and he became a multimillionaire overnight. Um, not necessarily a billionaire in today's, in today's environment, but a very significant multimillionaire. So I saw punch in the face. But, you know, a number of those other metaphors are really interesting when you look about uh, entrepreneurship. I mean, the word, you know, luck was used somewhere. And I was reminded of the definition of luck by a basketball coach in the United States who was very, very famous uh, a coach, John Wooden, who coached the basketball team in the University of California at Los Angeles to, I think, at least 10 national titles in the United States. And he said, quite simply, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. One of the characteristics of a lot of entrepreneurs is that they have explored lots of things, but suddenly people say, well, it was luck. Often, he would argue, it's where preparation meets opportunity. And I also am um, very keen on the notion of serendipity. A lot of people who make breakthroughs often do it by means that are slightly serendipitous. And I was reminded of this very, very recently when I was looking at all of the responses to COVID-19. And one of them was a response that came out of uh, hospitalization in the first waves of COVID across the world uh, in order to alleviate the symptoms of people who had what is now called long COVID, long COVID. But a very simple translation and exploration of the linkage between steroids and anti-arthritic drugs has produced a combination that's reduced the effects of people going into hospital, not needing ventilators, and so on and so forth. What I'm tr really trying to say is the advantage of entrepreneurship and however we teach it is that people look at new ideas, explore the futures and give us the insight in knowledge teams in universities as well, despite their regulation to make the world a better place. And, you know, I applaud Demo's work. I applaud all the questions. I think that however we teach entrepreneurial thinking, which is from a scholarship viewpoint or through incubators plus mentorship plus active team-based projects, we should be doing this and doing more of it. And there are, as Morris said very earlier on, people who've been doing this for a long time Open innovation founders like Clayton Christensen, who sadly died recently, but there are others. And with that, I would just come back, hope that I've done justice to what was an excellent talk, but also to the students. And there must be some students of the uh, higher education program in Bath on this call. 
the, the work that's being done and will be done on, on entrepreneurial universities, it's really interesting work. And it's not my own work. There's a hell of a lot of other people doing it. And I think that is a tremendously important research area. So with that, I know my time is up because the beautiful face of um, Rajni has flashed across my screen. So I'm obviously getting um, sent to the exit. So with that, I, I thank everybody, but uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Howard, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, you did more than justice to uh, Demo's talk, but you also uh, brought forward some very interesting uh, contradictions and possibilities, as well as the big dangers of um, how over-regulation starves innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think, especially for us, at the cutting edge of increasing uh, marketization coming together with increasing regulation in this weird tangled dance, um, it, it bodes uh, a lot of dangers for us looking forward into how we in universities um, innovate. Um, you spoke about some of the students on the DBA and I think Emma Hunt uh, has done a fantastic thesis on the entrepreneurial university. And I think John Davies is also here. He's also worked on that. Um, so I just very much like to thank Demo for his just brilliant presentation. Uh, you can tell Demo from the way in which the, the participants just kept engaging, you know, the way I had to kind of more or less force Jürgen off the stage. Um, it was just absolutely fascinating and, and insightful. And I liked the fact that you didn't give us easy answers. You, you spoke about the, the conflict, the contestation, the need to balance, um, and, and also the, the kind of non-formulaic responses, what it means to be intrinsically um, motivated, but at the same time to look at the structural constraints and, and opportunities. And that's a pretty mean feat. So very many thanks. And Morris and Howard, thank you so much for being just brilliant uh, respondents. You each took us in different directions. And when, when I bring what the two of you have said together, it just kind of adds a very, very different dimension and very important dimensions to, to Demo's talk. Jürgen, many thanks for your excellent, um, being an excellent respondent, picking up the key questions and um, kind of making them your own in a way and channeling them so well to Demo. And finally, just to, to thank the, the participants who were really, really brilliant. Um, some people have asked whether we will share the comments and the chat, and I think they are so rich um, that we will share them. And we might ask Demo if he wants to respond to some of them in, in writing. So we will share the, the, the recording, the slides, and, and, and the participant comments as well. And very finally, uh, thank you so much to Morris for being the most brilliant um, co-host and to Morris's team um, who, you know, Howard and um, Dineshri and Seiko for their, all the work they did behind the scenes, which made all of this possible. So thank you very much, everyone. And good evening, good afternoon and Goodbye. take care.